The Institute has, as you know, a constant uh, overview of issues with regard to justice, home affairs, uh, criminal activity, etc. And we're very, very pleased today to have Detective Chief Superintendent Pat Clavin with us, and he's going to um, explain, in a way, if we don't know already, why Ireland has focused on civil asset seizure. He's going to talk a little bit about the history of the setting up of the Criminal Assets Bureau and the future direction of the Criminal Assets Bureau. Um, and uh, frankly, since we set it up in 1996, um, it has been an example for countries all over the world. And we were joking with Pat that sometimes he, a celebrity in places like Norway and Malta and is on their television because those institutions are sending people over to discuss the Criminal Assets Bureau and what it does. And the amazing thing is that it isn't in existence in, mo in an awful lot of countries. You'd think it would be now. Um, there's a whole issue of the Asset Profiler Network and also he's going to talk a little bit about some trends in the, in the kind of penetration by criminals into the motor trade. Uh, we think criminals as drugs and thefts and cryptocurrencies, but there's a big issue with regard to the motor trade. And um, things go on around our country that most of us don't know, and maybe we're better off not knowing um, what's going on around you. But I was saying to somebody that we probably all have stood drinking a glass of wine or a cup of tea with people who are serious criminals and we don't know it because they dress like us, they talk like us, they may have been to the same schools as us. And um, the job of people like Pat Lavin and the people working in the Criminal Assets Bureau is to identify those people and take them out of society or take their assets out of society because with those assets they can further increase more criminal activity and also seduce in a way people who are in need of something and find that maybe the way to go, the path to take is some kind of criminal activity and we have to try and protect people as well from getting into that. So Pat, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Pat follows in an illustrious path of people who have headed up the Criminal Assets Bureau. Faulkner Murphy, where's Faulkner? Here. Oh, there you are, sorry, <laughs> I was looking down further. Faulkner Murphy headed up the first one. Um, I was very pleased and honoured to have been in government when we instituted the Criminal Assets Bureau on the back of some really serious murders, Veronica Guerin and um, the murder in Limerick of, of your colleague, uh, whose name is just... Jerry McCabe. Jerry McCabe, Jerry McCabe and, and um, so they, uh, their legacy lives on in the Criminal Assets Bureau. So Pat, we look forward to hearing from you and afterwards there'll be time for questions. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much, Chair, and it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge your own support and your future vision at the time in 1996. Um, we've often said that, you know, while we have slightly modified the Criminal Assets Bureau, we haven't changed it very much over the years because actually the model was got really good at the, at the beginning. So to acknowledge yourself, I also want to acknowledge the presence of Faulkner Murphy, the first Chief Bureau Officer and later Garda Commissioner uh, for his constant support. With me are Kevin McMeal, the fifth Bureau Legal Officer who, you know, follows on from people like Barry Galvin and others who put, who were good public servants over, over the years. Um, and Detective Superintendent Jair Egan and Ben Ryan is here from the department just to make sure that I don't stray too far away from the pat. <laughs> I'm going to, um, I'm going to try to be as open as I can but I, I won't say anything in relation to a matter that's before the courts or, or that, I may, that, will, that, that will get me or anybody else into trouble. So let, let people just understand that. Um, the first thing about the Criminal Asset Bureau is that it's wonderful that its title actually tells you everything about it that you need to know. It's a bureau or body that only targets criminals and whose sole job it is to take their assets. It takes their assets in a number of different ways, through proceeds of crime, through taxes, and through recoveries of social welfare payments. Um, but you know there are many bodies that do the type of work we do, but you won't see what they do in their title. And actually, it's something that we would hold on to for, for, for dear life. Um, so I suppose, just to kind of set it in context, I'm talking about denying and depriving we, we go after local targets, we go after national targets, we go after international targets. 
we're, we're not really discerning about who, who we take on. But, you know, lots of people think, oh, you only go after the big stuff. You only go after the big drug dealers. You don't go outside the M50. You know, you, you wouldn't be interested in our local drug dealer. We're interested in anybody who, who uh, fits our criteria. Um, so, I just, oh, sorry. I suppose I, I was reminded by what the chair mentioned there about Norway, um, and I was particularly minded by uh, a, a, a female lawyer who spoke on the Norwegian television after their visit, and I suppose her, her, her line was, isn't everything grand the way it is? Um, you know, we don't really need it. Uh, the criminal system works quite well. We actually don't need this at all. So I'll ask the question then, is every crime reported? And clearly it's not. Is every crime detected? Unfortunately not. Is, is there a suspect located for every crime? Definitely not. Um, are, are there always charges brought? No, unfortunately. Is there always a conviction, even when you do bring charges? And again, unfortunately not. And then I have some positive questions. Are drug dealers operating through underlings? Most definitely. There are some really big drug dealers who have no convictions for drugs offences because they don't dirty their own hands. They operate through others. And are proceeds of crime converted into cash or property? Definitely. Like, you know, somebody who's stealing jewellery or other valuables will fence that off and will lodge the money into either a bank or invested in property or, or otherwise. So there is a need for another complementary way of law enforcement. I am not against the criminal law enforcement. I'm all for it, and I welcome people um, being made amenable, and I think that in certain circumstances, people should go to prison. Um, what we do is complementary to uh, criminal law enforcement. It's not, it's not either or, it's complementary with. <clears throat> Um, so I suppose we then look at, well, what, what, do, what do we target? Do we target the man or do we target the asset? Um, that, I think that's the man called John Gotti. So in criminal law enforcement, we tend to look at the person. In our line of work, we, we go after the thing. We go after the asset uh, rather, than, rather than the person. Um, and we use um, a process of, of civil law enforcement. So I suppose to give some context to it, and there are people in this room who obviously have a better historical knowledge than I have, um, but we did have the troubles in Northern Ireland, and that did bring about um, lots of guns in the country. You know, when I was young, I think every Friday there was a bank robbery somewhere. You don't really hear that as much anymore. There were ATM robberies. There were lots of things like that. So guns became more commonplace in Ireland. And then we had the heroin e epidemic and the start of organised crime groups as such, probably from the 1980s onwards. And I think, you know, the legislators were uh, up there early. There, there was a piece of legislation brought in overnight called the Offences Against the State Amendment Act 1985, specifically in relation to funds that were in a bank account in Navan County Mead. Uh, the case is called Clancy. And so, in a sense, that was a precursor for what, what was to come in in later Proceeds of Crime Act. But along the way, we were moving towards uh, looking at assets through the Criminal Justice Act 1984, and I see Michael Brady here from the DPP's office. Um, we had post-conviction asset seizure, and like ourselves, the standard of proof is, is civil in relation to, in relation to the assets. Um, then moving it forward, we had the awful murder of Ron Gagirin and Jerry McCabe in 1996. CAB was established on an ad hoc basis, I think July, August 1996, and on a statutory footing by the 15th of October 1996. Now, I don't think we could imagine that happening in Parliament these, these days, unless there was something really, really big, because it's difficult to get legislation passed with, with agreement. Um, so the Proceeds of Crime Act 1996 is the legislation for non-conviction based asset seizure in Ireland, and we operate on the civil standard of proof, which is the balance of probabilities. Um, the Criminal Assets Bureau Act 1996 established CAB as a statutory body and that was the primary piece of legislation, a short piece of legislation that hasn't had to be amended very much over the years. <coughs> um, so I give some credit to a criminal with personality, Martin Cahill the General, um, most definitely needs to get a mention because he's the embodiment of why you needed the Criminal Assets Bureau in Ireland. Um, 
he, he didn't work other than as a robber. Um, he, uh, he drew the dole, he drew social welfare. He had a number of houses. His domestic arrangements were colourful and complex. Um, <laughs> and uh, he was a notorious criminal. And he kidnapped and shot, or had kidnapped and shot, an official who dared to withdraw his social welfare payments, uh, who later became the Secretary General of the Department of Justice. And essentially, he went around with a balaclava, covered, covered his face, and he was having a right good laugh at this society and at this country. And there was, there's a Today Tonight programme from, I think, about 1988, um, wherein he's interviewed by Brendan O'Brien and RTE, which you can Google and you can find on YouTube, and he makes a joke out of, out of the law in Ireland. So happily, in, 19, in 2005, his trophy properties were seized by the Criminal Assets Bureau and sold, notwithstanding the fact that he'd been murdered by the IRA in Dublin in 1994. So the proceeds of crime is our main piece of legislation in terms of asset recovery. There has been a new Section 1A uh, inserted in um, the summer of, of 2016 and I, you know, I would say that 2016 was a turning point as well in that you had the Regency murder and that would have been, I suppose, a wake-up call to, to lots of us. So you now have an administrative power of seizure. So if somebody is driving, for example, um, a fancy SUV, um, a bureau officer can seize that SUV for 24 hours. I, as chief bureau officer, can administratively authorise its detention for a further 21 days and then we move into section two, which is our first order, which is a temporary order, which has got ex parte in the High Court. After we get um, our ex parte order, the threshold of value you would expect to go up over the years. It started off at 10,000 pounds, which was rounded to 13,000 euros. But that was reduced in 2016 to 5,000 euros. And we take that that we are meant to go after low value assets. Um, and we have done so. The lowest asset value we ever went for was in July this year, which was 5,010 euros. At, in this, at the same time as we probably went for the highest single asset value in the case, which was over 50 million in Bitcoin. So, you know, we go for small, we go for big, um, and that's, that, that, that's what we do. After we get our Section 2 order, the other side is made aware of the order, and we then move into a full hearing, uh, and if we get the order under Section 3, it lasts for seven years unless there's a consent order uh, agreed under Section 4A. Quite a few of them actually do consent to, to an order because they want to get cab out of their hair. Um, and then Section 4, uh, when that happens, the asset is vested in the state. And you know, if it's a house, we sell the house and the money is, is remitted to central funds. And that's essentially how we go about our business. So what are the elements that we would have in a typical case of ours? So we introduce evidence into the High Court in affidavits, and we cover investigations into the criminal origins of the asset. We have to satisfy the court that this actual asset represents in whole or in part the proceeds of crime. Um, we also have to satisfy the court that this person is engaged in criminal conduct. Now, criminal conduct can be anything, any, any form of criminal conduct that results in the acquisition or generation of wealth uh, is criminal conduct for, from our point of view. We would get our revenue people to do an analysis of the person's declared income because it, nowadays we will have lots of people who actually will have a tax return done. They will have maybe a minimal uh, earnings declared to, to, in a sense, legitimise themselves. So we have to say this, are, this is their declared income. The, 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 the target or spouse or family may have some benefits that, that are coming in. We have to... Uh, tell the court about, about those, so our social welfare colleagues will, will swear an affidavit to that effect. Um, we have accounting people and we have analysts, and they would go through and do an analysis of the flows of, of income that are coming in and that are going out, and you know we are focused on what's the unexplained part of, of what they have. We have technical people that do ICT examinations, so they can look at phones, they can look at computers, whatever else, we have our own um, bureau staff that can do that. And then my own um, affidavit is called the Chief's Belief. I must swear a belief. My belief is evidence in court. It can't be, you know, I can't say it's a great day, that's a belief, or it's, tomorrow's going to be a good day. It has to be, 
you know, something that isn't a ball belief or a bear belief. It has to be supported by the evidence of everybody else. And that's open to challenge and open to cross-examination. And the judge must be satisfied that my belief is reasonably held. And if we get that, we're on our way and we've turned the tables towards the other side. So the structure of CAB, it's a small body. Um, and we put, for lots of reasons, we put the Department of Justice and Equality, they, they pay for us. And uh, they provide our bureau staff. And uh, we work very closely with them. And they provide you know, our new policies, our new laws. Um, and we surround them with people from the Garda Síochána, people from the Revenue Commissioners and the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection. So we move into a building. We have a single building. And we all live happily ever after that in, in our structure. But I'll, I'll go into some little bit more detail on that. <coughs> Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to focus on two uh, pieces of legislation. One is our objectives. And the way I cover our objectives is I say it's about C, A, B. So we spend most of our time doing C, which is conducting investigations quietly where nobody is aware of it. And we're doing preparatory work and we're trying to get evidence of A, which is we want to identify assets that are from criminal conduct. So that's B. Or sorry, that's sorry, that's A. And then finally we want to get to B, which is the taking of appropriate action under law to deprive or deny those persons of the assets. So we go C, A, B, and that's how we go about our work. That's our objectives is, is to conduct investigations, to identify assets, to take them. Um, so our statutory functions are threefold. The first one is we're required to free, seize and confiscate the proceeds of crime, which is done through the Proceeds of Crime Act that I've just described. The second one is we are required by law to tax the proceeds of crime. So we have revenue uh, bureau officers who work with us and on our behalf they will tax the proceeds of crime. They're required by law to do that. Lots of people find it difficult to kind of understand this, this whole idea of taxing the proceeds of crime, but the law requires us to do that. And thirdly, our uh, Social Welfare Bureau officers are required to investigate and determine social welfare claims by any person engaged in criminal conduct. And strangely, the one person who can direct CAB to do something is not the Minister for Justice nor the Garda Commissioner, but it's the Minister for Social Welfare. So the Minister for Social Welfare can direct, where, where, where the Minister believes a social welfare officer may be subject to threats or other form of intimidation, Minister can, as a matter of mandatory direction, require us to take on that target. It's called Section 51D of, of the Act. We get a small number of cases uh, ev every year wh where, where the Minister makes such certificates. So that's, that's uh, an unusual feature. So the CAB model, um, you know, people talk about the Ryanair model, the Aer Lingus model. Um, well, the CAB model is, is, is worth looking at. Right from the start, it was a multi-agency and multidisciplinary body. Um, and we wouldn't change the basic model if we were starting all over again or going into the future. We think that the model was got fairly right in the first place. So the team room where people sit in an open plan office, so you'll have guards, you'll have revenue taxes, revenue customs, social welfare, they sit around and they're allocated cases and they work together in, in the team. So you don't have a taxes room, you don't have a Garda room, you don't have a social welfare room. The team room was at, very much at the heart of what was decided. We have a closed computer system with the utmost secrecy. We don't have any mobile devices. We have our closed computer is in one location and one location only. Um, and that has, that has remained the way. Um, we have a single office in a single location, which we think is hugely important. We don't have satellite offices around the country. You know, we have, for protection reasons and for other reasons, it's very important to us that all of us are, are together and that we're able to look out for each other together. But we're able to um, draw upon the support of the larger agencies, in particular on Garda Síochána. We're able to draw upon uh, the, the revenue, be it taxes, be it customs, and we're able to draw on our social welfare colleagues. So it's not that we're operating in, in isolation. If we're doing a big job, we will always have people from other agencies helping us out. And that's one of the reasons why, we, as a body, we've been able to remain small. 
Um, but we're also supported by professionals. The accountants are very important for us because we need professional accountants to be able to satisfy the court about the flows of funds. I'm not an accountant, but we can get accountants that can, uh, I suppose, translate what to me looks like gibberish into something that's meaningful and that I can understand and that ultimately a judge in the court can understand. And we have analysts, you know, we have, we have probably some of the top digital people that I know of work, working anywhere that are really good at looking at devices, that are really good at searches and uh, other, other activities. Um, and I have to acknowledge that uh, for a small body, we have really good legal cover. We have a Bureau Legal Officer, Kevin, Kevin fulfills that function. But we also have an office of the Chief State Solicitor's Office, which is co-located with ourselves. And that has been there from, from the start. Um, you know, we think that that office needs to grow in accordance with, with our own growth because it, it, it's a very important part of what we do. And I'm looking at an ad here. I think it was a contractor. Um, I'm from a, an agricultural background. And the agricultural contractor would advertise his wares and say, no job too big and no job too small and distance no object. So I'm saying no target is too big and no target is too small and uh, distance is no object. So anywhere in the country or anywhere beyond, we are prepared to, to consider it once it meets our, our criteria. Um, so our structure then looks a little bit on, on the complex side. So I'm the Chief Bureau Officer. Um, Kevin is the Bureau Legal Officer. We put the Chief State Solicitor's Office in dots because they are co-located with us. They are not our staff. They, I think, ultimately are attached to the Department of Antishuk. Um, but CAB could not operate without them being co-located with, with ourselves. So we have Garda Síochána, Taxes and Customs, Social Welfare. The Bureau Analysis Unit includes the Accountants and the Digital Specialists um, and Analysts. Uh, all our administration people are civil servants from the Department of Justice and Equality. Um, there are no Gardaí involved in administration in CAB. There never were. Um, that has been the way from, from day one. And we have our own small IT unit. Um, down at the bottom, we have two changes. IAO is called the Intelligence and Assessment Office. I call it the Goods Inwards Department. So typically, um, somebody who's an asset profiler will send in somebody that they think that neighbour has, is driving too well and he or she never worked. So our intelligence and assessment office look at that and see, is this likely to be a good target for ourselves? And we have a high enough threshold. It's hard enough to get taken on by the Criminal Assets Bureau. But once you get taken on, it's very hard to get off the wagon. You know, once, once, you're, once cab are after you, it's, they say it's hard enough to, to, to get off the wagon. So if, if they get through the intelligence assessment office, we have what's called an admissions board and the admissions board make a decision to admit them as a formal target. If we reject them, we don't reject them as such, we file them because we may get more information at a later date uh, that says that we can take them on, so all won't be lost by the fact that at this stage we don't see them as a viable target. And we then allocate them to the six investigation teams that are made up of Gardaí, Taxes and Customs and Social Welfare. Um, and then at the very end, the AMO means the Asset Management Office. The management of assets is a very important function for us. So, for example, we have to sell houses, we have to pay local property taxes on houses, we have to cut the grass, we have to pay the electricity. You know, there are lots of things that you have to do when you have assets. And we have quite a few assets of various kinds, from a uh, racehorse in one instance, to uh, houses, to Bitcoin, um, you know, lots of money, lots of bank accounts. We control assets in a number of different ways. And we decided um, in the last two years to set up a dedicated office to manage out those <coughs> assets and to realise the best value for the taxpayer where, where the money ultimately goes. Um, so our numbers, roughly half of us are Gardaí and roughly the other half are not Gardaí. So there are 47 currently our authorised numbers, 47 members of Gary Shikana, 21 from the Department of Justice and Equality, uh, which includes Kevin, the accountants, our admin people and our IT support. We have 17 from Revenue, Taxes and Customs. <coughs> and we have six from Social Welfare, which is, is now called Employment Affairs and Social Protection. <coughs> so... Examples of criminal conduct, I said that we would look at any form of criminal conduct that <coughs> generates wealth, so most of our cases 
revolve around drug trafficking at, at the back of it. But we've also other, other areas like brothel keeping, burglary, robbery, theft and fraud. That's a big issue for the common people of Ireland. Lots of people are bothered about machinery thefts, you know, their farms have been broken into, their houses have been broken into. <coughs> Corruption and extortion is something that has always been there. There have been some celebrating cases down the years in, in terms of corruption in planning and other areas. And more recently, we've had cases that, that relate directly to extortion by criminals of people like builders. <coughs> fuel laundering and fuel smuggling is a big issue. We have one particular case that re revolves around an, an international mail fraud. Uh, and cases like that we're always willing to take on. Lots of motor trade offences like what's called a missing trader that, you know, the books are designed to look as if all the cars have come from somebody, but when you go to find that trader, that trader doesn't exist at all. The books have been, have been cooked to design to make it look that way. And there are also VAT and VR, VRT scams that are within the motor trade. Um, we had one case uh, called Phantom Secure Technology, which uh, involved somebody in uh, North America providing secure technology to the South American uh, drugs cartels, but opened a, an office in Dublin and had a, a bank account here. And we have revenue offences as, as a potential form of criminal conduct. So the types of assets that we have come across would include, cash is our favourite, it's the easiest one to deal with, and in, in fact if it's in a bank account, all the better. Um, but we've had to deal with cryptocurrency um, Bitcoin and Ethereum are two that we've had to deal with. We were ahead of the game in terms of law enforcement in, in dealing with those. Money in accounts, uh, high value watches, jewellery and designer bags. They're a big issue. There, there was a time that maybe on a search we would have walked away from watches and bags and whatever else. But it's, a, it's, it's amazing the amount of wealth that can be pumped into uh, designer goods like that. <coughs> Houses and land are always a feature. Overseas property. Um, and high-value department store cards is another area where you know, we've come across somebody who is on social welfare and had a platinum gold card for a well-known um, department store. And apparently you have to, it was like the old days when we had our Lingus cards, you have to spend a certain amount over the year or you get downgraded from your platinum card. And you know, this, this was a person who was claiming social welfare from, from the taxpayer. Um, so, we have focused very much on asset profiler training, where we train mostly Gardaí <coughs> around the country um, to extend our, our, our remit beyond our modest size. We train mostly Gardaí, but we train them from the other departments as well and from any other law enforcement that we can engage with. And so we encourage divisions and units to submit profiles on criminals who may have assets. We ask them to be our eyes and ears. And we conduct two asset profiler training courses a year. We do about 60 at a time. And, you know, we have brought people in from other agencies. And indeed, some of our UK colleagues have asked us to sit in as observers, you know, both from Northern Ireland and from, for example, HMRC in the UK. Um, and profilers are trained to be the eyes and ears of CAB in the local division to spot likely targets, submit a profile report, conduct local inquiries, and very importantly for us, if they know the person's background, they can swear what we call the criminal conduct affidavit. So, you know, I won't know personally every criminal that's in Donegal or in West Cork. So the, the local asset profiler fulfills a big role for us there. Um, so this is what we tell the profilers to look out for, evidence of wealth, houses with bulletproof windows and doors, and these are not your um, trophy homes. These are very often three-bedroom, modest houses in, in local authority areas where there's an inordinate amount of money pumped into them. Uh, excessive spending on ren renovations and what I call the man cave, the, the shed at the bottom of the garden, which is converted into uh, the man's room so that the man can go out and do his coke and drink his beer and free from all interference from the outside world. Um, it's usually a sign that something isn't, isn't right. Um, in terms of cars, executive cars, SUVs that are frequently changed and perhaps registered to a third party or a false name or address, exotic holidays in places like Las Vegas, Dubai, South America, Australia, very often to Spain, Canaries and the UK, very often centred around maybe boxing tournaments and, and other issues like that, that might be an indicator of the type of people that we're interested in. And some of them create fictitious employment, so they want to give the illusion that, that, that they're employed. And if you can manage to break it, 
they will actually be paying the, the so-called employer you know, to create the illusion that they're employed by them so that they have tax and that they have, have a record. They'll maybe get a mortgage on the basis of it. They're well able to, to, to work. There are businesses that are fictitious as well. You know, we've had garages that are fictitious. We've had uh, security uh, firms that exist in name only. Um, and then we have high-value goods like bags, clothes, footwear, jewellery, watches, and store cards. Um, so when we uh, train people in, uh, as cab profilers, we, we cover the legislation relating to cab, and then our other agencies, so uh, Revenue, Customs, and Social Protection, cover what they do. We cover anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing. Uh, we cover the investigation of money laundering. Uh, we always get uh, an input from the asset seizure unit of the DPP's office uh, on post-conviction confiscation, and that office works very closely with ourselves in, in lots of ways, and indeed would, would use the asset profiler network at, at times. Uh, we teach them about asset identification, and we give them certain investigative tools. We show them how to compile an asset profile, and you know we tell them what their own responsibility is as an asset profiler. Um, it's important for us, I think, to look at uh, the programme for government. So the most recent programme for government is in 2016, and that programme commits to reviewing the existing proceeds of crime legislation and ensuring that adequate support, uh, adequate resources are provided to support CAB in tackling money laundering and target the proceeds of crime. Um, and, I, I mean, in, in 2016, we had an amendment to the Proceeds of Crime Act that gave us our administrative power of seizure and also reduced the threshold of value. We are constantly in discussions with the department about reviewing the legislation, and if we spot new trends, we'll always be passing it on to our policy people. Um, the government commits to examining how communities can better engage with CAB, including the provision of information on the suspected local use of the proceeds of crime and the potential of a smaller CAB being established to target regional or local assets. We, as a body, are against uh, mini-cabs or local cabs or regional cab. We think that the cab that you have is quite a mini-cab as it is. It's, it's 91 people compared to, I suppose, 17,000 in Agar Shikana, maybe 7,000 in revenue, um, maybe 10,000 in, in social welfare. We, we think that uh, you will dilute what cab does if you, if you try to create uh, local or regional cabs. But again, we're happy to, to discuss that. As an alternative, we have put a lot of effort into the asset profiler network and working with the local communities, and we briefed all the joint policing committees throughout the state from November 17 to December 18, all 36 uh, JPCs we, we, we briefed, and we got a lot of information in as a result of that. Uh, we have a map here that shows, like, in 2016, we had about 600 person targets <coughs> throughout the state. That's gone to 1,321 in September gone. Uh, of note is that uh, about half our targets are in the Greater Dublin area, just slightly less than half, and about slightly more than half are outside of the Greater Dublin. Within Greater Dublin, um, the DMR West, which stretches from Finglas to Ratcool, has 235, which is twice uh, the numbers in the next highest, which are its near neighbours of DMR North and DMR South. Uh, Limerick City and County is the next biggest area outside outside of it. And then we noticed growing trends in the counties around Dublin, like Dublin, Mead, Wexford, Loud, uh, counties that, that you'd expect um, that are close to Dublin. So what does CAB do well? Um, it uses multidisciplinary investigation teams to identify and target assets to deny and deprive criminals of ill-gotten gains. It does what it was set up for. It doesn't pretend to do anything other than what its title says. That's what it has always done. And it, it, it complements other law enforcement. It doesn't, it's not operating exclusive to other law enforcement. Uh, if I say this, I think one of the most effective things we do is we carry out large-scale search operations on warrant. And when we do that, we are about 80% of the journey there. We have a fair good idea of what we're looking for. It'll be conveyancing files. It'll be evidence of spending. It'll be assets. Sometimes we bring specialists that will look at how much was spent on that house. So you could have a modest 250,000 house and we could satisfy the court that a half a million was spent on it in, in renovations and, and uh, extensions. Um, we've been targeting lower and mid-tier criminals with the object of, I suppose, preventing them from becoming the godfathers of tomorrow. If we could hit them harder earlier, we feel that some of them mightn't go on the life of crime that they would otherwise. 
We present our cases in public in the High Court, with the exception of the first case, which is ex parte. All our other cases are presented in public, and the public can see what's happening. And in our own way, along with other law enforcement, uh, we help to dismantle organised crime groups. In terms of ICT, we have a closed cab system, but all of our officers have access to what we call their mothership system. So a guard has access to the guard of pulse system, a social welfare officer has, has full access to the social welfare information, and the revenue taxes and customs have full access to their system. That's very powerful to bring all those people with all that information. The act that was set up in the first place allows for the exchange of information without, without any issues. Um, we are bringing it, uh, sorry, we have a digital forensic science lab in place so that we can examine computers and other devices. We have two new developments, one that's imminently about to be implemented, which is called the Asset and Financial Management System, so that we will be able to produce like management reports about where our assets are, where our monies are. Um, it's, it's, it's necessary that that, that that be brought in. We, we have to put ourselves on a professional footing. And e-discovery is about having the ability in, in a computer system to examine big data. So there are, there are big solicitors firms, for example, that have systems that are able to uh, look through big volumes of computer-generated data and you know, ask them questions, interrogate the data, and help us in a way that you know, if we got 500 extra people, maybe if we had a good e-discovery system, we'd be able to better do our work than necessarily getting uh, extra people. Um, so I'm going to talk about very briefly about two two cases. Um, one is Operation Loft, which was about the um, uh, fuel laundering that happened around uh, Hackball's Cross in County Loud. But reading the story about that was like reading a novel about the whole illicit fuel trade right throughout the country, because you had garages in every town, particularly ones that had no brand on them, where you had tankers delivering fuel in the middle of the night or early in the morning, and um, it, it, you know, it was actually corrupting the whole fuel trade throughout the country. Um, and so CAB went after that entity, and the case was finalised and settled in favour of the Bureau in 2018. Um, and this is David Byrne, who was murdered in the Regency Hotel. Um, again, as I say, in my view, it's a turning point in, you know, that caused us to start thinking again about organised crime. Uh, so CAB went after the Byrne, Byrne Organised Crime Group and seized assets at worth 2.7 million. And one of the features of that case, which we called Oper Operation Lamp, was that cars were being used as currency, that cars were actually being swapped between criminals where money wasn't necessarily changing hands, so somebody is owed a drug set, give them a Range Rover or give them an X5 BMW instead, and they're all happy. The car won't be registered in their name. If the police stop them, the car disappears or is swapped with, with somebody else. So this is what the judge recognised in, in that court. And so this is the nicest picture that you will ever find, which is the site of a transporter taking away uh, the cars from... Uh, LS Active Cars, as it was called, it should have been called LS Inactive Cars because there, were, there was no trade going on at all there. All that was happening were, was that there were criminals meeting for a crime summit and they were swapping cars with each other. When we went through, I think, 29 days of CCTV, we didn't find a single car sale that took place within the 29 days. And so the court was satisfied that this motor business was used as a slush fund for the Bourne Organised Crime Group, which we told the court was the Kinhan Organised Crime gang in, in Ireland. And so I never miss an opportunity to give out our telephone number, 666-3266. Please phone us with information. Um, it's inevitable that somebody in this room has, has information. You won't be asked to press 1 or press 2. You'll get through to a human being who will transfer you to somebody who will take your call. We also have an email address which will be answered, which is info at cab.ie. We have a very basic website, www.cab.ie, and we're on Twitter and Facebook. And that completes my presentation, Chair. Okay.